Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our IOTechs and Hacken webinar on protecting your smart devices from modern hackers. Uh, we have myself, Larry Pang from IOTechs, and Daima Buderen, uh, the CEO co founder of Hacken. And today we are going to be walking through a lot of cybersecurity con uh, um, concepts and especially focused on how you can protect yourselves and your businesses from modern day hackers. Um, so, you know, but just before we get started, I uh, want to put uh, a name to a face. So I just want to do a short introduction of you, Daima, before we get started. Yeah, hi. Hi, Larry, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting, of course. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, honor to uh, present a webinar with you because I studied your product and it's like, it's really amazing and it's really what is needed right now. Uh, my name is Dima. I'm um, 34 years old. I don't know if, if this really matters. I have uh, uh, Deloitte eight years experience uh, in the corporate world and a little bit of uh, military and um, now four years in crypto absolutely love it uh, cyber security in crypto is booming and uh, we uh, are doing all our best to protect users from uh, black hat hackers and uh, education is the key in uh, this you know war uh, everybody has to be aware of uh, the risks and today we will also show uh, the actual, you know, uh, methods how hackers uh, trying to get into your private life. So hope uh, everybody will like it. Uh, hope ev nobody will repeat it. Let's say like this. Yeah. In any case, we show only, you know, like some uh, some kids stuff. But uh, the logic you will see uh, it's you know real world cases. Exactly. And, you know, just to echo uh, Dima's um, you know, introduction, you know, we came together, IOTechs and Hacken, from a very big mutual respect for each other's projects. Uh, you know, Hacken has an amazing cybersecurity suite um, and, uh, you know, also a uh, boot camp uh, already for a lot of people to go through and just understand the basics. But in this webinar, uh, we're also going to focus on, you know, how uh, you know, IOTechs and Hacken are creating products and solutions, just as Dima said, not just focusing on the problems, but how we can address the glaring gaps in cyber uh, security and privacy today. Um, so with that, you know, we're just going to kick things off and get started. So again, uh, for those of us, uh, those of you guys just joining, uh, we are live streaming on both Zoom and YouTube. And what we're going to do is we're going to take your questions throughout the, the webinar. So whether you're on YouTube, or on Zoom, uh, just feel free to drop your questions um, and we'll get to them right at the end of the, the webinar. Um, but today, just to, to kick things off, you know, this webinar is called Protecting Your Smart Devices from Modern Hackers. Um, today, what we're gonna cover uh, during the webinar is uh, we're gonna kick things off with a short introduction about IOTEX and Hacken. And uh, Dima's gonna take us through uh, a couple of important concepts about how hackers can choose their targets how hackers collect information about their targets, how hackers gain access to user systems, and how to protect your devices from hackers. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Dima is going to cover more of the smart home, uh, smart city concept, and IOTEX is going to fill in you in more about hackers and smart homes. We're going to break down the network of a traditional smart home, talking about all the different modems, the routers, the connectivity types, and where the risks are today. And then we're going to talk a little bit about UCAM, which is one of our uh, new products that addresses some of these issues. Uh, before I pass it off to Dima, uh, I'm going to give a short, uh, very, very short introduction of IOTEX. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Dima to do the introduction of Hacken and kick off his part of the presentation. So IOTEX was founded in 2017. Uh, we have a vision for what's called the Internet of Trusted Things, um, a play, of course, on the Internet of Things and embedding trust into it. Um, you know, our real mission at IOTEX is to empower everyday people and businesses to own and control their smart devices, as well as the data and the value those smart digital devices generate. So trying to democratize the internet of things while also maintaining privacy and security as guiding principles. So uh, we're gonna dive into more about IOTEX and our products 
uh, later on in the session. But I'm going to hand it over to Dima to kick things off um, from his end with an intro of Hacken and his part of the presentation. Go ahead, Dima. Or yeah, do you want to share your screen, Dima? Um, yeah, uh, Larry, if you don't mind, uh, uh, I would like to share my screen because I have videos. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Love the artwork behind you, by the way. Is that a is that a, an office space? Office space mural? Uh, yeah, it's uh, we're working uh, co-working, and uh, this is like meeting room. It's a perfect, uh, you know a key, uh, perfect backdrop. You know, like uh, uh, second New York, I would say, in terms uh -huh. of uh, design and style. Like it's uh, really a nice place to live. And if you wasn't uh, in Ukraine before, uh, I I recommend, you know, you'll be very surprised. I love it. I love it. All right. So let me see. Okay. Uh, is my, you can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, very short about hacking. So yeah, we also were born in 2017. And uh, we were focusing on building uh, an ecosystem that protects not only a B2B business, but also B2C. Uh, and we built uh, um, few pro products. Like the first product was a bug bounty platform, Hacking Proof. Right now is the biggest platform for crypto exchanges, um, uh, bug bounties. Uh, we have FTX, uh, uh, Gate.io, uh, Qcoin, a lot of uh, uh, exchanges choose us. And uh, it's a place to make money for whiteheads. You know, so if you're a whitehead, go and uh, check this out. Uh, our uh, main uh, business generating unit is Hacking Cybersecurity Services. Uh, we are uh, leaders in blockchain security. We did around 300 smart contract audits uh, till, till today and keep uh, doing them uh, every day, every day. Uh, our product for B2C is uh, Hacking Eye. It's an uh, all-in-one solution and continuously developing to uh, uh, give user a 360 protection. And of course, one of the, um, you know, uh, our uh, very important product is CER.Live. It's a crypto exchange ranking uh, and analytics platform and is uh, developing into uh, much uh, broader than just crypto exchanges. It, it is developing into a portal for all the data for cybersecurity in crypto and soon in other um, uh, industries. So uh, yeah, um, we also have a token, of course, uh, called Hi, and um, join our Telegram group. Let's say like this. So uh, yeah, let's start with education. So uh, first is how uh, hackers choose the targets. Uh, so imagine we are hackers, and uh, you know, uh, imagine no, imagine you are a 16 years old boy. Uh, from, uh, I don't know, um, I don't want to, <laughs> from some uh, not very um, powerful country. Uh, you don't have a lot of money, but you have internet and uh, you want to make some money. And um, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of uh, darknet forums where people are um, teaching uh, these small boys who are uh, or girls uh, who want to make easy money how to actually hack. And uh, today we will uh, follow a very simple example uh, that is connected with Shodan. So uh, first, uh, a hacker is doing a research and uh, let's play a small video and uh, I will explain what is happening. So uh, uh, first he goes to a Google map uh, for, for example, uh, a district where he lives or maybe he goes to a Google map uh, to some city in US, uh, we made uh, an example for uh, Idaho. Uh, uh, so he is uh, selected uh, some village or some town, and he uh, copied the uh, the latitude, the address into Shodan, and he posts uh, a very small script. I want to stop here. Is has screenshot true? So he will look into all devices. Uh, let me uh, emphasize this, has screenshot true. So he will look into all devices uh, around this area uh, that are online and that uh, uh, are uh, showing some video stream. And this video stream is available in the internet. So uh, he does this in order to find the target. 
uh, that might be of his interest. Uh, so he selected and then he just scrolls uh, what webcams are there and just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling some garage. Okay, maybe next one. Uh, what is next? Uh, something is hidden, some not. Uh, it's, it was uh, 172 targets uh, in this area. And again, 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 uh, some, uh, some remote desktops are shown. Okay, uh, why not? Uh, some bedroom, whatever. Uh, some lake, nice, uh, interesting. Uh, then uh, he finds something more, something that can be used. Okay, let's stop here. So what do we see here? Probably some office or maybe restaurants or I'm not sure what is it. But you can see in the right corner there is a POS terminal. And there is a computer probably connected to this POS terminal or maybe some, uh, you know, other uh, uh, machine that is working with money. Okay, so this is what catches uh, an eye of a hacker. Uh, as you can see, we found it like in two minutes. Uh, then, uh, okay, uh, let me I'll come back here. Uh, so then when he sees that he's copies the uh, uh, IP, okay, uh, and he, he clicks and he see that this is a, a screenshot from a webcam that is looking into this, um, into this uh, place. Okay, so uh, the first task is done. So the, t the hacker has uh, made the research, he found uh, he, uh, an interesting target and uh, what he will do next. Okay, um, there is absolutely no sense trying to, you know, to log in into this camera unless the hacker wants, uh, is using a tactic to intimidate a person. You know, sometimes uh, I don't want to go into this uh, route. You know, everybody, I hope everybody saw the TV series of Black Mirror when uh, guys were uh, intimidated by, you know, hackers for some not very for some uh, uh, ethical behavior. But yeah, uh, we are uh, thinking right now as a hacker who wants to steal money and not intimidating people. All right, so uh, then the next step, uh, he uh, will find, uh, he uh, will try to um, do a search uh, for the same, uh, um, uh, for the same IP address. Uh, that is uh, in this area. So he will try to find a computer that is uh, uh, connected to the same internet and try to find uh, the way to uh, get into it. Let's uh, uh, see a video. So this is, uh, he uh, copies the IP. He sees that it is uh, connected to internet provider Sparklight or something. Um, he is uh, uh, narrowing his uh, um, uh, search, 79 only now. And uh, he starts to look uh, whether there is some uh, uh, device with the same IP address that might be uh, similar to this um, computer that we see on the screen. He searches, he searches, oppa. okay, this is the webcam. We saw it already. Um, all right, uh, he checks the ports, he uh, remembers the port and he starts to see uh, if this port is also can be found at Shodan. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is exactly what it is. So we found that computer and we found that it is, it has some administrator, it has some user and um, Basically, uh, right now, we already uh, identified the target that uh, the hacker wants to hack. So uh, coming back uh, to the actions, yeah, research, results, camera, new target. So now the next step is to try to hack this computer. So what he's doing next? Uh, so he knows the username uh, and now he just needs to uh, use some of the brute force technique uh, to try to get access into this computer. Um, 
every every hacker has a very huge long list uh, of uh, usernames and passwords and uh, but you know 90% of uh, passwords like they are in the uh, one uh, only 1000 uh, uh, commonly used uh, list so um, it actually doesn't take too much time to go through this uh, 1000 uh, password list and uh, the success rate for this hacker is pretty high so what i can say is that uh, hackers are very lazy and they are not spending uh, too much time on one target maybe it's 15 20 minutes if uh, uh, doing a simple brute force didn't succeed succeed okay they will just switch to another target and uh, the working day will continue and most probably out of 20 30 targets that he uh, checked during the day two or three will be successful um, he will not go into very, uh, you know, uh, complicated brute force and trying to uh, hack very uh, difficult systems. He will go for the easy ones. So if you have a password password, <laughs> you'll be hacked in zero milliseconds. Okay, so we, I will show you right now how the brute force uh, technique looks like. So he, we already has the username, it's medhater. Uh, we are uh, adding this uh, small uh, txt file with the password list and the program starts to brute force. Very easy, you know, starting to, uh, you know, um, you see uh, the passwords, uh, the most commonly used passwords are pretty, <laughs> pretty funny, to be honest. Uh, 69, 69, 69, uh, nice. Uh, so, yeah, we will not go into details, but you can, as you can see, the brute force that the easiest tool uh, runs pretty fast and um, um, let's not waste too much time looking into this you know uh, madness uh, uh, but uh, let's think about um, your passwords um, if you used uh, one of these passwords um, you, you are just lucky you, you are very lucky that hackers still didn't uh, get uh, uh into your system or maybe they did and they're just waiting for some uh, perfect timing but um, you have to understand that uh, during this covid era and during this um, very uh, you know unequal world and era of uh, online uh, criminals are, are becoming cyber criminals and uh, uh, all these techniques are available to them and it's just a matter of time when they will start uh, attacking normal people, normal uh, everybody's devices. And you need to act now to change uh, all your uh, uh, passwords and settings. Okay, let's move to uh, uh, so let's move to conclusions. So uh, the most easy, uh, the most uh, easy step to uh, that you can do right now is to create a unique uh, strong password. Um, I understand it's very hard to remember unique passwords and it's much easier to remember one and use it uh, everywhere. Uh, but uh, the problem is that um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the uh, portals uh, that you use uh, was, uh, are, are hacked. Uh, and uh, these um, portals... Uh, um, the databases of uh, the user passwords and logins are leaked and uh, you usually it takes about six to nine months when this leak is discovered of course hacker is not running uh, you know to to the world and saying hey i just hacked amazon i stole all their database and now i have all the usernames and passwords no he doesn't do it he just keep it to himself or to a group of uh, people like them. And they just uh, use this uh, database to start uh, getting into other accounts. So for example, you have um, login your email and login your uh, favorite password. That's, I don't know, some dating website. And uh, you already forgot about it. And this dating website was hacked. And then they, uh, the hacker uh, is using the same login, the same password and start to go to Instagram, to Twitter, to Facebook, and whatever. Uh, and if you don't have 2FA, then the chance that you will be hacked is 
super uh, high. Uh, and uh, once he gets into your uh, uh, messenger, uh, probably he will see some uh, messages that um, someone else will don't need to see. Um, and uh, he might uh, start intimidating you and sending you print screens with your messages and warning that I will send it to your fiance, please pay me some money. So again, uh, this is uh, how hackers think and this is how they act. So uh, the, another thing is that using the shutdown, um, uh, you, are, um, you can see the webcams and the webcams uh, have default passwords to, uh, you know, to get in. And uh, of course, hackers know the full passwords of all the uh, webcams and IoT devices. So uh, the, the must step when you buy some new device, new IoT device, you need to change the password uh, of it. Um, of course, keep software up to date. It's, uh, uh, it's not, you know, uh, because uh, usually the software is updated, not because there is some nice uh, feature that you don't uh, want to miss. Usually it's updated because there is some uh, uh, vulnerability that hackers can exploit. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a must thing to do. Uh, and uh, the, uh, as from, for our uh, approach that we uh, uh, educate, uh, we have created the educational cyber bootcamp and we have uh, created the biggest uh, database for uh, stolen uh, personal data, uh, Hakenai Darknet Monitoring. I will uh, tell you a, a small story. So yeah, the database is uh, more than 13 billion uh, breached accounts. Uh, it's bigger than have I been pwned. Uh, of course, we all respect have I been pwned, but uh, our database is a little bit unique uh, because we also show you your passwords that, are, uh, that were leaked. So if you go into our uh, application, um, you download it and you uh, check uh, your email and you verify that this email uh, belongs to you, we show you a hint, what was your password? Uh, so um, my personal email was uh, in, in uh, data breaches, uh, I think 15 times. And uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, uh, nice to remember my old password passwords from uh, 15 years ago and from two years ago. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, another reason why you need to uh, change them all the time. The biggest um, uh, uh, number of breaches I saw, uh, it was Don Tapscott. Uh, I, I'm sure you heard about this guy. Uh, he's uh, blockchain, you know, uh, one of the men that's... Uh, uh, sh uh, showed the blockchain uh, to the world and his account was breached 115 times. So um, it, from one side is a good thing. It means that he's super active in the internet. He is like uh, all into new things. Uh, and But from another one, uh, I hope he is not using the same uh, passwords on his devices. So yeah, uh, you can go into hacking.ai darknet mon and just Type your email there um, it's, and you will see the number of breaches. If it's more than zero, you need to do something with this. Okay, and of course, Cyber Bootcamp. Um, in our application, we uh, have gathered uh, essentials that uh, a human needs to know about cybersecurity in uh, 2021 or like and, and ongoing. Uh, we uh, have included models how you should uh, manage your account. Uh, the, the models are interactive. Uh, we even reward you with NFTs uh, so that you are more motivated to pass them. Uh, we put some jokes, some tricks, and uh, so that you are not bored. Uh, for sure, uh, passing the cyber bootcamp is better than uh, spending uh, evening uh, in your Instagram um, uh, switching the accounts of people. So yeah, account management, basic rules, anti-phishing. Uh, you know, uh, phishing is uh, sometimes, you know, we, uh, we sleep uh, during uh, surfing the internet and we click uh, things that look very common to, um, uh, to us, just like fishes. 
but uh, this is how hackers uh, want you to think. They want you to uh, not recognize that this is phishing attack and you make a magic uh, press of the button. Privacy, we uh, learn you how to not disclose your personal data in the internet, how to protect it. Um, uh, data protect protection is about encrypting, encrypting your devices uh, so that if your laptop is stolen, there is a way that nobody can get your data. Um, and this is very important, uh, especially uh, being in crypto. Um, so that if you, if you properly inscript your uh, laptop, uh, no one can find a hidden file with your private keys. Uh, general security principles and digital asset security essentials. So, of course, uh, the uh, era of crypto, when we are responsible for our private keys, for our seed phrases, is the era when uh, uh, if you lose your digital assets, you cannot recover it. And uh, I had uh, once an accident uh, losing my uh, crypto. Uh, it, it is really painful, and I hope uh, uh, no one who is listening now uh, will lose crypto uh, after this webinar again. Uh, okay, uh, so um, that's it. Uh, we will. I will answer the question uh, after the uh, Larry presentation. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Dima. There's actually one right here that I think is very relevant um, to the cybersecurity bootcamp. Uh, Eric Van uh, asks, uh, can we use a VPN to avoid hackers? Um, how can we use a VPN to avoid hackers? Uh, all right. Um, so VPN uh, is, um, um, in fact, it is, uh, it's more used by hackers, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in order to hide your uh, presence. Uh, but uh, in common world, uh, people are uh, using VPN in order to... Um, you know, to surf Facebook in China or to look at some websites that are not available in other countries. Uh, but uh, the uh, VPN in uh, uh, new era is uh, uh, is developing into anti-phishing protection. So uh, imagine uh, when you are connecting to VPN, you are connecting to a remote computer uh, that is managing your incoming traffic. So uh, it can put certain filters uh, that uh, uh, are blacklisted uh, by this VPN provider that uh, protect you from phishing attacks. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's um, uh, hackers are uh, all the time, it's, it's their bread, you know, so they are all the time creating new websites, new uh, applications and they are always a little step uh, uh, in front of uh, all the anti-phishing uh, uh, protection tools. Of course, there are uh, uh, startups that are working on uh, AI anti-phishing protection, um, but uh, you know, um, you didn't hear about these uh, VPNs probably because they are not that effective uh, as, of, as of now, but I'm sure in future they will. So, um, um, yeah, hacking also has a VPN. Uh, it has uh, uh, anti phishing protection, and we are working to improve it. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, it is better to use VPN than uh, without it. Uh, our, in our VPN, we are focusing on uh, the speed so that you are not, uh, uh, you know, um, so that you are not uh, uh, limited uh, by using it uh, to download stuff. But again, uh, education is the key. Absolutely. You know, uh, there's one more question before we move on to the next section from Krishna. Uh, and they ask, what about Tor, the private browser? Do you think it will be safe for everyday use uh, and avoid others from tracking us? Uh, you know, uh, so, Tor uh, hides your identity in the internet, uh, and uh, it's uh, you know it, it hides the incoming traffic uh, that you receive. But uh, if you decide you know to click on some uh, uh, you know hey free giveaway from Vitalik Buterin and uh, 
uh, yes, uh, install this uh, browser plugin and you'll be notified by all the giveaways in crypto world. Uh, Tor will not uh, protect you from this, you know. Uh, there never install nothing on your computer uh, uh, from unauthorized stores. So all the browser plugins are extremely dangerous. They are stealing your data massively. And this is the most, uh, you know, uh, favorite technique right now. I had so many uh, um, examples when people were installing browser plugins and they were stealing, uh, they were losing crypto. So, um, yeah, uh, so it is up to you what you click in the internet and Tor will not protect you. Absolutely. You know, just because our audience is more crypto focused, right? I think it's important to really repeat what Dima said. You know, make sure whatever plugins and websites you're pushing your private key or your mnemonic into that that is trusted. You know where it came from. Uh, there's been way too many instances where people, you know, uh, get a, uh, an email to update their key pass plugin. And uh, it says you have to re-enter your private key. Imagine, you know, you lost your phone. You have to reset up your Google Authenticator app. You know, whatever you put into that is your private key. And once you do that, then it's game over, right? The hackers have won. So um, this education is massively valuable. I think everyone needs to go check out the Hacken Darknet Monitor and the Bootcamp to make sure that you educate yourself uh, even deeper about all the things that Dima um, said today. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, Dima, any, any closing thoughts here? Yeah, yeah, I just want to add that uh, uh, the browser plugins, uh, hacker browser plugins, they work in the way that they don't even ask you for a mnemonic or uh, whatever, uh, or private key. Once you install them, they have full access to your, uh, uh, all your data. So, and they will search for uh, uh, keywords uh, and they, uh, if you have unencrypted uh, file with uh, the uh, private key or seed phrase backup, they will find it. So, yeah. In this modern world where, you know, the world is literally changing around us, we also have to change to modernize our culture, our education, our understanding, right, Dima? Yes, and another one important thing. So if you ever uh, registered, I don't know, in some uh, not very reputable exchange, uh, then the hackers, 99.9% uh, .9 know your login, know your email. And you're in the database of potential crypto millionaires that they want to hunt. So uh, if uh, if you registered a non-name, a non-reputable exchange, and you use the same password as usually, you're in trouble, my friends. Definitely. You know, I think best practice is for any crypto-related account, have a separate email for it. Have a Don't tie your phone number to it. Don't tie your other emails to it. Um, if you lose that account, you lose it, right? Um, but at least your funds are protected. So yeah, yeah. Proton Mail is, uh, is takes I don't know one minute to set up, so it's very easy to use, and it does not track your uh, data. Um, I think Proton Mail is okay to advertise; so they are doing a great job. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dima. I think we've learned. I've even learned so much from your presentation. Uh, we're going to give a different spin on uh, this topic now. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, more specifically, uh, you know, hackers and how they view smart homes. So this is more of a top-down approach that Dima uh, kind of explained, right? Uh, uh, boiling the ocean, you know, trying all these different password combinations, um, but uh, for more specific targeting, um, we're gonna show you exactly how a hacker can view your smart home, where the target points are, and just uh, some general thoughts around how to protect yourself. And then we're gonna talk exactly about how UCAM, IOTEX's uh, new home security camera, uh, kind of addresses some of these big flaws in uh, existing systems. So with that, I'm gonna kick off my part of the presentation here, um, hackers in smart homes. Um, I wanna start with something very uh, high level, right? A lot of people uh, hear this word IOT, but what does it actually mean, right? What is the Internet of Things? Uh, to me, the Internet of Things is kind of the gateway between the physical and the digital worlds, right? It's composed of billions of devices today. To, uh, by 2025, there's estimates anywhere between 50 to 100 billion 
smart devices will be out there in the world. And not only the number of devices is increasing, but the amount of data and the types of data that these devices are capturing is growing exponentially more than the number of devices. So by 2025, they're estimating that 80 zettabytes, one zettabyte is one trillion gigabytes. So 80 trillion gigabytes of data are gonna be generated by our IoT devices. Um, and IoT devices, you know, a lot of people consider them to be very, very different, but the anatomy of all IoT devices are very similar, right? Depending on how they're used, whether it's in agriculture, smart home, smart city, of course, the types of data uh, about the environment they're in is different. But at the core anatomy of an IoT device, all of them are consisting of some type of sensors to capture real world data, some type of wireless module like Wi-Fi, cellular, Bluetooth in order to transmit data, some type of battery or power supply, and different ranges of processing, memory, storage, compute, et cetera, depending on the size of the device. Uh, and all of this is strung together with proprietary firmware, usually to connect the hardware and the software. Um, diving into this a little bit more, right? What is the data life cycle of your typical IoT device? So all of your IoT devices generally do similar things. Again, in different environments, this may look different, but generally the device is doing the acquisition, the processing and the communication. So all of these different types of sensors, you know, uh, are converting physical phenomena into digital data, whether it's your GPS location from a location sensor, whether it's the temperature, humidity, air pressure, et cetera, from a climate sensor, whether it's acceleration, angular velocity, and general motion data. There's so many different types of sensors today, whether it's smoke sensors, moisture sensors, proximity sensors, infrared sensors, all of these things are ways to capture uh, traits about the real world and convert them into digital data. Uh, so once we have that raw data, what happens to it? We can't use it if it's completely raw, right? We have to add some processing to it. Uh, so these raw data from sensors will go through different rounds of data aggregation, data validation, and then data analytics to turn this data into insights that can be used or information that can be used uh, downstream, right? Um, depending on the power of your device, sometimes this happens directly on the device, right? If you think about any gateway that has a lot of processing power, this is a concept called edge computing, right? Where you're doing a lot of the data validation, aggregation, et cetera, on the device itself, instead of waiting for it to be passed to a centralized server in the traditional world to do the processing. Um, but some weak, uh, like sensor only devices may only be data, data acquirers and data communicators. So again, depending on the use case and depending on the style of device, this data processing step can happen either on the edge or on a server itself. And finally, the communications part is also interesting, right? Uh, the types of connectivity mechanisms we're really familiar with today are things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, but there's so many other different connectivity types that are out there, right? Even within those categories, there's different types of Wi-Fi, whether it's 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, uh, cellular has so many different varieties, 5G, 4G, 3G, even cellular IoT. And even within your smart home, something that we'll talk about is there's different types of connectivity protocols that have different types of security and different types of ways for hackers to get in. But the last part, any IoT device really needs to do is communicate the data they have acquired and send it to a server, either through directly through Wi-Fi or through a gateway through those different types of connectivity types we're talking about. So now that we know the general anatomy of a device, I just wanna share with you the landscape of what smart home devices cover, right? These are all different brands doing different types of IoT devices. And you know, when you look at this, you can really think about, okay, my home has all of these things as well, right? All of these things are entry points for hackers to look into your specific data, right? Things like general smart home solutions, lighting, security and monitoring, energy and utilities, different types of home robots, alarm systems, kitchen and home appliances, smart locks, audio and media, health and wellness, et cetera, right? There's so many different varieties of devices and they're all connected to your internet. And you know, one thing you have to know about your smart home is data is constantly flowing between your devices. And let me show you exactly what that looks like. So this is just general 
uh, schematic of what a smart home today looks like. It's a network of smart devices that are interconnected through these connectivity types and each device serves a specific purpose. So, you know, generally as a smart home owner, you are familiar with accessing these services from the convenience of your smart home. But behind the scenes, the data to, you know, see the current temperature in your home goes through a lot of different hops and each hop has its own risks, right? So uh, generally everything is connected to the internet, right? Whether it's the cloud-based applications and services you use today to interact with your home. Uh, there's also the concept of a modem. So the modem connects your home network and the devices on it to uh, the internet. Uh, there's also a router which creates a wireless network across your different uh, devices. And sometimes the modem and the router these days are the same device, but they can also be separate depending on the solution, right? Um, from the router, there's a lot of devices out there that do connect directly via Wi-Fi, and they can connect directly to this router, right? Because there's already a Wi-Fi network emitted by this router. But for other types of smaller devices, um, you know, Wi-Fi is very battery intensive, right? So not all the devices out there, especially the ones that are battery powered, can support Wi-Fi. So they need a low power, uh, different types of connectivity. And that's exactly what a lot of the smart home devices today use. It's one of three connectivity standards. Of course, Bluetooth is uh, free and open, um, uh, a great way to, you know, this is the thing that powers your airdrops on your iPhone. Uh, Bluetooth has incredible bandwidth. And again, it's absolutely free uh, and also has decent security. But there's also a lot of different connectivity standards around Z-Wave and Zigbee which are more proprietary, they're more consortium based, and these standards are evolving all the time. But the way that these devices that run Bluetooth, Z-Wave, Zigbee connect is through your smart hub, which syncs your router to these Bluetooth devices. So it's kind of uh, converting the digital readings and giving it to the router through these connectivity types, and the smart hub will connect to the rest of your network via Wi-Fi. Um, so this is just a general schematic of your smart home, right? And what is really interesting when you think about it is all of these independent touch points are uh, opportunities for a hacker to intercept your data. And all of these devices here are opportunities for hackers to brute force enter one of these devices and maybe through that device can tap into your overall network. So it's incredibly important to understand, you know, your smart home network is not just the devices that you put in them. It's also your router. It's also the connectivity. And it's also everything in between that you make, need to make sure that there's no single point of failure in your smart home system. Um, the most common types of smart home attacks today, as we mentioned, there's both network style attacks and there's device style attacks. And the logos you see here are all real types of smart home attacks that have gone on in the past couple of years, right? Uh, we can start on the network side. So network side, a lot of the times, uh, they're trying to stuff your network so that you know it can't do anything. The most common type of thing here is denial of service and distributed denial of service, DOS and DDoS attacks, right? And this is basically when they send incredible amounts of signals into your network to jam it up. And a lot of the times, these are not real people that are doing it. They're actually bots or actually bot nets. So they're programmed to specifically attack your network, take down your websites, uh, if you've ever seen, you know, some of the anonymous style attacks where they take down government websites, it's usually through distributed denial of service, uh, just to flood the network. And this can really have an impact on, you know, the way your smart home operates. If you can't send information or there's too many signals going out, then your, your network is going to be stuck. Another important one is man in the middle attacks, where for unencrypted credentials, they basically insert themselves in between two devices that are talking to each other and will steal your credentials from this transmission, right? So any one of these uh, situations, there's always these the need for these devices to authorize or authenticate that the data coming from the device is accurate. But a lot of the times, the traditional security systems of today don't build that in because they don't prioritize security like they should. So man in the middle attacks have impacted hue light bulbs and also Z-Wave in general, where a lot of credentials as Dima kind of walked through. Once hackers have your credentials, then it's open season for them. They can really do some scary things with full access to your network. Um, on the device side, there's also the concept of vulnerability exploits where 
uh, hackers can gain control of your device. And this can uh, most likely be through the password related items that we're talking about. So if you have a, a camera out there and a hacker has your password to it, that doesn't, that means they have full access, right? There's no need to, um, you know, uh, go behind the back door. They're literally walking through the front door. So really have to protect that front door, make sure your passwords are sound. And, you know, the scariest one here on the device side is probably malware, right? These things can live in your devices or in your applications behind the scenes without you really knowing it, right? So um, Amazon Alexa and a lot of big uh, device types have already been affected by malware attacks. Uh, the most important part is to know what updates you're putting into your uh, device and application and just make sure they're coming from a trusted source. So a lot of these things on the device side and the network side um, share similar types, but ultimately they uh, are Im impacting uh, your overall smart home network. The final type is eavesdropping and information theft. Um, usually when the device talks to the network or devices talk to other devices, um, similarly to man in the middle attacks uh, where you know, they have access to your uh, decrypted information, eavesdropping and information theft, if the data being transmitted uh, is unencrypted, then they can steal that information. It's not necessarily stealing your credentials, but whatever is being passed. So uh, hopefully this gives you an understanding of, you know, the range of your smart devices. It, I hope it encourages you to think about how your smart home is currently set up today. And if you think about this concept here, I would say the most important part is to make sure your router and your modem are hardened, right? Because all of the data is flowing between your smart home into your modem and router um, and to the internet, right? So this is kind of your data dump from your entire smart home, making sure that your modem and your router are protected, are up to date. Uh, a lot of my friends, you know, haven't updated their firmware on their router for years. And that is just inviting hackers to really take a closer look at your network. So. Now that we understand more about these risks and the schematic of your smart home network, let's talk about some solutions, right? So um, just to start, this is kind of how the world looks like today. You know, the entire IoT ecosystem is very, very siloed, right? None of these devices can talk to each other and it's kind of purposely by design, right? A lot of these big tech companies are playing the game of vendor lock-in. They want to have your data and they want to make it hard for you to move off of their platforms. So you continue to use their products, right? But what we're looking for in the future is moving the data ownership from these big tech companies back to the users. So we want in the future, the, the future to be human centered and interoperable. Um, so data owners in the future will be holding their information. And this is really, really important for a lot of reasons. And this is really exemplified for the first time in UCAM. Uh, UCAM is a new product from, Am uh, from IOTEX. Uh, we won the CES Innovation Award for Cybersecurity and Personal Privacy for UCAM uh, back in 2020. And it's the first camera that's out there that really applies all these principles that we're talking about during this webinar into a real world product. And we'll explain really the, the different types of technologies that empower UCAM to be absolutely private. But it's really important, I wanna stop here just to, to, to share some thoughts around um, you know, why UCAM is important, right? Um, in January, there was a really big mass migration from WhatsApp to Signal, right? Signal is like a private messaging app, but WhatsApp also markets themselves as a private messaging app, right? So what caused this mass migration from centralized private messaging app to decentralized private messaging app? And I think we're at a turning point in our world's history where trust in our governments and trust in our corporations as it is at an all time low, right? So the, the claims that big tech is telling us that your data is end to end encrypted, you know, we care about your privacy. You know, these claims are kind of like boy who cried wolf, right? It's getting harder and harder to trust anything these big tech companies say. So when we think about these kind of situations, we really have to be mindful about, you know, what are the actual provable claims that these products have? And why are these different architectures going to solve the problems that big tech has put on us? And I would love to walk through how UCAM does that exactly. So there's, there's four core technology pillars of UCAM. UCAM is not only powered by blockchain. That would be really lazy and incomplete, right? But you know, we use blockchain as a very important uh, tool to establish 
a trusted identity for the device, which serves as a foundation for everything that happens above. You know, going back to this um, diagram here, by giving devices a decentralized identity, you can empower them to own their own data. And by you owning that device, you also own that device's data outright. So it's like a little nested function where you, know, you have a decentralized identity and your devices all will have a decentralized identity that allows you to interoperate with them, communicate with them, and own them outright. Unlike today's world where you own the devices at a physical level, but at the digital level, all of your credentials, all of your data, all of your videos are owned by big tech. And that's a problem. Uh, another big one is edge computing. So we've not only applied, uh, we've not only removed the concept of traditional email or password login and replaced it with the blockchain based login. You know, uh, to, to Dima's point, uh, passwords are very easy to breach today, but a blockchain private key, an IOTEX private key, will take infinity years, I think it's 10 to the 28th years to crack. So that's why you know, removing this very error prone thing, even if you tell the entire world to change their passwords, a lot of them may be too lazy to do it or don't understand why they need to do it. So using blockchain based identity by default gives them extra security on that front. Um, and in addition to that, we do all the processing on the edge. There's no centralized processing. So all the uh, computing is done on the camera or uh, your mobile phone, meaning all the processing, all the computing is done on devices that only you own. So you can make sure that your device footprint is transparent and is owned exclusive, exclusively by you. Um, user owned storage is another big piece of it. Uh, but the last piece is end to end encryption. So end uh, to end encryption is a really important concept today, but there's a lot of people that lie about it, right? There's a big story last year that Zoom, the platform that we're streaming from right now, they made a claim that they had end-to-end -end encryption when in fact they did not. They had another type of encryption called client to server. So we're gonna explain exactly what true end-to-end -end encryption in UCAM means uh, in the following slides. So uh, what is decentralized identity, right? Um, centralized identity is one that we're very familiar with. You log into a website and you create an account, a one-to-one. -one. So that's with centralized identity. Uh, there's another thing called federated identity where it's more like I create a Facebook account or a Google account, and I'm gonna use it to log into many different websites, right? So register once, trusted by many. Um, but the difference between a decentralized identity and these other two forms of identity is the other two forms of identity are owned by other people. If Google wanted, if you breached Google's terms for whatever reason, they can take away your Gmail, right? They can take away your Facebook. They can take away all these things that really are core to your identity. Imagine if that happened and removed all the connections you had on these platforms. So a new variety of identity is where users create their own identities, uh, register once, and it's trusted globally, right? So this is a really powerful concept uh, about interoperability and about user control that we apply in UCAM. Um, this is a really big one that I wanna talk about, right? Um, for, for those that read the news, right? Uh, you see end-to-end -end encryption in the news all the time, but it's really important to dig in and understand what that actually means as compared to uh, what happened before, right? So as far as encrypted communications go, there's one variety, it's called client to server encryption. And luckily the name basically implies what it means, right? It means from the client, meaning the device that you own, to the server, which is owned by whatever company you bought that device from, all the encryption, uh, all the communications are encrypted. But once it hits the server, then it's decrypted. And the reason why they are able to decrypt your information here is because they hold your identity, they hold your keys, right? So very much the same as you know the the spirit of blockchain, your keys, your funds. Um, we need to apply a similar strategy about your keys, your data, right? And I can't stress enough, this is really the reason why there are so many hacks in the world today, right? A lot of the hacks you see um, are in styles that Dima shared earlier, but they're also, you know, uh, kind of people that work at these companies, right? There's a big story about ADT, some employee was spying on people having sex for mo multiple years, right? So a lot of the hacks today are from people within those organizations and having un, uh, decrypted access 
to every piece of information from that you know is being transferred in between your devices is a really big issue, right? Um, so what's the solution? The solution is to not have this you know unencrypted stop. The the the, the solution is to take what was happening in the centralized servers before and process them on the devices that we own. So whatever was happening in here before, whether it's data validation, data aggregation, processing, um, you know, uh, utilizing the data to generate some type of action, computing is at a point today where we don't need to run all of these processes within a centralized server. We can do them on the devices that we own and we can have true end-to-end -end encryption, meaning from device A that I own, it's going to be fully encrypted all the way to device B that I own. And there's no stops in between where people can take a peek at what's happening with our information. So uh, it's really important to not only seek out products with end-to-end -end encryption, but also validate that they do have end-to-end -end encryption. If they don't have a white paper explaining how they do it, like we do for UCAM, then that's a problem. Uh, I'm going to drop the white paper link right on YouTube chat here and Zoom for you guys to check out. Um, the other thing is around edge computing, right? We already talked about this a little bit. It's the concept of running your processes, not on centralized servers, but distributing them to devices. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's very similar to the concept of blockchain, right? You're taking what used to be a single point of failure and distributing them out to be collectively processed uh, using consensus across many different nodes, right? Edge computing is doing something very similar, where instead of running all those processes in a centralized server, you can distribute those responsibilities to devices that are trusted and have extra resources. So um, the intersection of IoT and blockchain is very, very strong because of this concept, because they're both based on this kind of distributed nature while maintaining consensus across all different nodes. Uh, and finally, you know, want to share a little bit about the UCAM architecture, about how it actually empowers all of these things to work, right? So on the public blockchain, you know, all of the identities of users are stored, right? Just like any other blockchain identity, we use it to enable users to log in to the camera. There's a there's a device binding step here, which means that the only uh, during the setup process, when UCAM is registered, it can only be registered to one device at a time. Um, and then that's a very important rule. So people can't enter your device. Once you've registered your private key to your UCAM, you need that private key to access any videos, which is a key to a lot of privacy. Um, again, all the processing is done uh, on the device, between the device and the camera. Um, and the storage of these files, regardless of where they're stored, you can store them on an SD card on the camera, or you can look into decentralized data storage options that we're currently pursuing or you can even store it on general cloud, right? But the important part, again, is that regardless of where you store your information, all of that data is end-to-end -end encrypted. So even if someone breaches the cloud or intercepts your information or you know, man in the middle attacks you, all of that information is fully end-to-end -end encrypted with the private key that only you own, right? There's no other private key that exists and you're the only one that can decrypt your files. Um, a lot of companies out there claim things like, we care about your privacy, we care about your security, but those are just subjective claims, right? We're the only camera company out there, or we're the only camera uh, powered by IOTEX out there that can make claims like, nobody can see your videos except you. So look for objective claims when you're shopping for your products. Um, and so this is kind of what the future looks like, right? UCAM is just one single device, um, but, once we piece together this uh, architecture into a smart home environment, right? All of our devices in the future will have decentralized identities that allow them to own their information, meaning you own your data, and also to interoperate with each other through those connectivity types that we talked about. Um, one other big thing that IOTEX is working on is this intersection of secure hardware, meaning these special secure element chips that uh, you use in your iPhone to unlock your phone with your face ID, or even the, the private uh, the chips in your ledger device that manage your private keys. We envision a future where, you know, hardware is getting cheap enough to the point where all of our devices will look like ledgers in the future, especially the ones that um, manage very, very sensitive information. You want that to be airtight, 
right? We're talking about your smart home information, your health information, things like this. Um, gateways are also important. You know, right now we talked about all these different connectivity types. Some of them only support one. In the future, there's going to be an interoperable universal IoT standard, uh, and all of your gateways are also going to have decentralized identities. So when they communicate with your devices, they can authorize that. Hey, I recognize this device's identity, which means I can trust its information. Uh, and finally, you know, where does blockchain play a role in this? Blockchain is going to be a really important orchestration tool, right? The premise of blockchain is that you can use predefined business logic. Um, smart contracts in order to enforce different rules and operating things. But who are going to be the actors that uh, enforce those rules? A lot of the times, you know, a smart contract can say, if I get this payment, then unlock this smart lock. Or, you know, there's going to be really interesting physical digital world connections where even actions from our physical world, like I am in a physical GPS location right now, and that data can trigger a smart contract to issue me an NFT. Say I'm at a concert or I'm at a restaurant um, and the GPS location can trigger that, right? So not only is it going from the physical to digital actions, but my digital actions, even me paying a smart contract can do something in the physical world, like unlock a smart lock, right? So uh, blockchain is gonna be an important ledger in order to register all these different decentralized identities that we're talking about uh, in a transparent and immutable way. Um, and will serve kind of as like a cross reference for devices to validate each other. Um, and finally, of course, you know, blockchain is gonna be an important engine for smart contracts and also represent a transparent and immutable ledger for all smart home activities. So, you know, with that, um, really want to encourage everyone to go out there and purchase a UCAM. You can buy one at ucam.iotex.io if you're international, or if you're in the States, in the United States, you can go on Amazon. It's for sale on Amazon right now, uh, ever since uh, October of 2020. So, you know, with that, I hope this was informative. We, we covered a lot of topics today, um, both around how, um, how hackers view uh, opportunities to hack, you know, general databases and why we need to protect our passwords as Dima uh, kind of walked through. And I shared more about what's going on behind the scenes of our smart homes, what kind of things we have to be paying attention to and what types of, you know, situations can we get into where hackers can see our information. So um, with that, you know, really want to encourage everyone to, you know, I think we should fuse our communities. What do you think, Dima? Um, and just do more of these education sessions. Um, we're happy to take some questions uh, now though. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I want to add that um, um, uh, 21st century is a good century. You know, we can create uh, a lot of uh, ourselves. Uh, you know, we can create Instagram ourselves, LinkedIn ourselves. And, you know, uh, so it adds you a lot of, uh, mm, how to say, um, you, you're creating digital identities and it uh, adds you a lot of uh, more uh, you know, presence uh, and you can do a lot of different things. But at the same time, uh, it means that you have uh, to protect uh, much more things. And especially with the crypto, uh, when uh, none of the banks can um, insure your funds, uh, you also have to put enough... Uh, uh, protection measures in order not to lose them lose them so um, it's just you know another thing that uh, we need to take care of uh, just like uh, locking the doors just like uh, um, I don't know uh, having the wallet always with you and smartphone always with you uh, you have to take care of your digital uh, assets digital avatars and crypto so uh, learn. It's uh, not very difficult. Cybersecurity only sounds scary, but it's not very difficult. Uh, I will put a link to our Telegram group uh, where a lot of uh, people uh, are uh, happy to answer any questions. We are a community of cybersecurity um, uh, in, uh, enthusiasts, so I, I will be very happy to see you there. Yeah, definitely. You know, join uh, Hackens Twitter as well. We're going to drop all of our links here um, about our Twitter and our telegrams. But, you know, uh, the Hacken IOTEX community are 
um, living on a very common denominator, right? We are all early adopters and early educators about cybersecurity in our modern world, right? So it's really important for all of us to spread the word um, and educate each other about what these things mean, especially your parents, right? Um, like I, it's, it's always an uphill battle to get them to change their passwords even, right? But there's so much more to protecting your smart homes today. Uh, I see one question from Adkunle in the, in the chat group. If you guys have any other questions, we can stay on for maybe another five minutes or so to answer your questions. Uh, but Adkunle asks, if password is weak and two-factor authentication is enabled, are we safe? Yeah. Um, I would like to answer this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, uh, there is two mostly common used uh, um, 2FAs. Uh, first is um, when you connect your uh, phone number and you receive SMS uh, as a second factor. And second is to use some Google Auth or some other authenticator. So when you use the, uh, um, the phone number, you are vulnerable to SIM swap attack. It's not only about, you know, someone uh, to try to take over your uh, phone number by calling your uh, telecom provider. It's also about uh, you uh, traveling uh, to other country. And uh, uh, when you travel to other country, your GSM network is not longer um, uh, belongs uh, to uh, your telecom provider. It belongs to their national telecom uh, provider, the country you visited. So they have uh, uh, a way to intercept your messages. Uh, there were uh, cases that even Israeli, uh, in Israel, the very you know, famous cybersecurity country, uh, telecom providers were hacked and people were losing their accounts because the uh, database of uh, 2FA uh, passwords was leaked. Basically, 2FA is not uh, is a password that is generated by uh, the company you are working with, and uh, uh, you you see only six digit that is uh, uh, changing uh, every thirty seconds. But in fact, is a password that they gave to you. They know it, and you know, uh, and your app knows it. Multiplied by um, time step, time stamp. So that's why you see the six digits. So. so if the uh, database of these uh, passwords uh, is hacked, then uh, a hacker can uh, hack your two as well. So, uh, but uh, again, I want to say that hackers are super lazy, extremely lazy. They are much. They don't want to go and uh, you know get a real job. Uh, this is how lazy they are. So, um, uh, if they see a two FA, they usually okay. Next one. So if you uh, put it, uh, just don't use the mobile uh, to face the uh, Google OS is much better. Definitely, you know, in security, there's a concept called security in depth, right? And, and uh, security in layers. And it really resembles what armies use, right? If you think about, if you have like, you know, you're playing Dota or something, you have your uh, home base, right? Your, your home base, and you wanted to protect that. How are you gonna do it? You're gonna put one layer of security, you're gonna put another layer of security, you put another layer of security, right? So 2FA is very similar to that. You're just adding another layer of security, but if your 2FA layer of security is linked to your original layer of security, then you're gonna bypass both, right? Meaning if, you're, uh, if your phone number and your Gmail are connected to each other and they can use one to access the other, they basically penetrated both layers of your security, right? So. Uh, a lot of times people recommend that you have one digital form of security, like a password or an authenticator, but you also have like a physical layer of security. And that's what a ledger is, right? Ledger hardware wallet is that second layer of uh, protection. Um, and maybe in the future, you know, two-factor authentication will change to three-factor authentication, uh, things like this. So it's important. I, to think I about use like my crypto exchange accounts. I use four layers of security. Four layers of security. Yeah, talk, yeah. talk, tell us about it. What, what, was, uh, what are those four layers? It's, uh, I, uh, once I want to make a withdrawal, I use, uh, I entered the uh, normal password. I entered the 2FA from my phone. I entered 2FA from uh, my email and I enter a special uh, password that uh, is not the same uh, as to login. So it's four layers. Yeah, 4FA, guys. Listen to Dima, 4FA is the new standard. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Let me see any other questions in here. Um, that's all the questions we have. Um, you know, again, join our Telegram, join our Twitter groups. We just drop them into the links here. Um, and, you know, we're happy to do more. Uh, if you have other topics you would like, like for us to cover, I think we can definitely uh, host another one of these to continue the education. Um, we really want to thank everyone for joining. Um, yeah, Dima, do you want to close things off with the last word? Um, no, I just want to say that I'm happy. Uh, that's it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm happy too. Um, uh, yeah, I hope everyone is enjoying the excitement in the crypto industry and um, across all the buzz of token prices and things like that. It's really important to remember that blockchain and decentralized technology has a real chance to protect us and change our world, right? Of course, everyone's having a great time making money left and right, but um, there is a huge uh, opportunity that we're addressing uh, that companies like IOTEX and Hacking are addressing. So um, with that, we're going to sign off for today. Thank you guys again so much for joining and we'll see you next time.